just how many people are dying from COVID-19. As it stands, more than one and a half million people have died of COVID-19 around the world. But official figures can only tell one part of the story. That's why scientists are calling for certain types of data to be used to get more reliable numbers, to help us better understand mortality in the coronavirus pandemic. First off, we take you to the Russian city of Ufa, where the discrepancy between the official coronavirus death toll and how many more deaths there are compared to last year is too wide to ignore. With a steady stream of coronavirus dead, speed is of the essence at the morgue. Every morning, the team from the funeral agency Ufa Ritual comes here to collect new victims of the pandemic. 29-year-old Artur Kinzikeyev has been working in the funeral business for 12 years, but he says he's never had to bury this many bodies. One time, there was a huge line of hearses standing in line outside the morgue. It was only then that people started to understand that death had really come. Call the relatives to identify the body. This morgue in the city of Ufa is only for people who died of coronavirus or had contact with an infected person. The bodies have to be sealed in plastic, the coffins closed. Many Russians feel their dead should be treated with more respect, Artur explains. The relatives are often more tense than usual because their dead are handed over to them in plastic body bags. They aren't allowed to open the bags. I tell them that right away. Some people cry and demand that we open the bags. Then I have to explain that they could get infected themselves. This virus is no joke. Yuri Kotslov has been in the business for seven years. Today, he's in charge of the team of undertakers. He says since the second wave of coronavirus, there have been at least twice as many deaths in the city of Ufa. Funeral agencies have had a tough time keeping up. We have more work, a lot more work. Over a million people live in Ufa, the capital of the Republic of Bashkortostan. Government statistics say that only around 90 people in the region have died of the coronavirus since the pandemic began. But the official numbers also show that during that time, over 4,000 more people died than last year. Coronavirus infections are spiking across Russia, but authorities insist the situation is under control. The undertakers aren't so sure. Today, Yuri Kotslov and his team are interring a 92-year-old woman. She didn't die of the coronavirus. That means her relatives can say their final farewell with an open casket, which is the tradition in Russia. Usually, funerals are big family affairs in Russia. But the pandemic has changed that. People are often worried about getting infected and stay away. So far, no one in Yuri's team has caught COVID. He can only hope it will stay that way. In Russia, people say if it's decided up there that you'll get run over by a streetcar, you won't drown. Fate is fate. If the coronavirus isn't my fate, it will pass me by. The next day, the team prepares for four more funerals. Artur and his colleagues hardly have time to worry about their own health. At the moment, they're just too busy. La Sylvester joins us now. He's the project coordinator of Euromomo. That, of course, stands for European Mortality Monitoring. Welcome to you. We've just seen a new daily record of coronavirus-related deaths here in Germany, totaling 590. Why do you think that number has gone up so sharply, considering we're in the second wave? Uh, I think the most, uh, what we're seeing is uh, now a very uh, widespread transmission of uh, COVID-19 in Germany and in many other European countries that is now reflected also in, in rapidly increasing uh, COVID mortality. But how do you think the numbers will develop further? Have we already seen the peak? That's a really good question. So if you look at the, what we experienced in the first wave in, in March in Europe, we saw a very rapid uh, increase 
in mortality within a few weeks and a very rapid decline after the lockdowns. Then we saw a very a quiet period during the summer in most European countries. But since around September, October, in, the, uh, in Europe, many countries have seen inc gradually increasing transmission, not only in small uh, focal areas, but widespread in the country. And this is now reflecting in a gradually increasing excess mortality. And we're not sure yet when this will peak exact exactly. We can hope that with the increased uh, restrictions we are now having in many countries in Europe, we will also see in our a, a decline again in mortality, but we're not sure yet. Can you please clarify for our viewers what exactly is meant by excess mortality? Yeah, so excess mortality is uh, more deaths than you would expect normally from previous years of, of mortality. So you, you, you calculate the, the expected average based on previous numbers and you can adjust for seasonal variations and then you see the difference from what you observe in the current time, current week, and you compare what we, would you would expect, and that is what we define as the excess mortality. And under situations when you have public health events, that, that excess mortality you can attribute to that event, which is now COVID-19. And we don't have actually other public health uh, events or explanations that could explain this mortality. So what we see is really a, a true picture of the total mortality from COVID-19 in Europe. Now, we've borrowed a graph from your organization showing deaths in Europe from 2017 to 2020. We're noticing in particular two market peaks, one from a severe flu season in 2018 and one in the first wave of the coronavirus earlier this year. This means coronavirus is definitely deadlier than the flu, doesn't it? How deadly is it exactly, according to your data? Yeah, I, I, it, certainly we see normally during the influenza season in Europe, we see excess mortality. And the example you show is from the very bad flu season in 1718, which was quite bad. But the, the peak we saw in the first wave of COVID-19 are many times higher. The mortality is, is many times higher than in the worst flu uh, influenza season we have seen. So it's particularly the group of 65 years and above. Uh, it, has, it, is, it is at least four, four times worse than in the bad 17-18 season. And it is more than 20 times worse than the mild influenza seasons. So it's very significant ex extra mortality we see during COVID-19 compared to a normal influenza season. Now, the pandemic has gone on for the better part of a year. We've all changed our behavior in a way to prevent more COVID-19 deaths. We're all wearing masks and social distancing. Has that had any impact on the number of deaths for other infectious illnesses like the flu? Yeah, I, I, certainly we have seen a very dramatic decline in, in other respiratory infections, uh, influenza. And as an example, in Denmark, we have seen a steep decline in meningitis cases. So that will also reduce mortality from those other infections. Thank you, Dr. Lasse Vessergaard. He's the project coordinator of Euromomo, or European Mortality Monitoring. We appreciate your analysis today. Thanks very much. Welcome. Up next, our science correspondent Derek Williams answers one of the questions you've sent in. What is the distinction between a vaccine's efficacy and its effectiveness? Every branch of science has its own vocabulary, and these two words from pharmacology have been used confusingly and often interchangeably in the last few months, although they mean different things. Um, for the general public, efficacy is, is the less familiar term. It describes how well a drug or a vaccine works in a controlled environment that's been designed to give clear answers. Um, that's because in the best of all possible worlds, an independent team should be able to take an efficacy study, conduct the trial in the same way, and, and reach the same results. So, so trials like the COVID-19 vaccine candidate trials 
will have some baseline parameters. For example, um, they do things like exclude test subjects with pre-existing yeah. medical conditions. Uh, the fundamental questions are, does the candidate work in healthy people safely in the doses that we're administering? And if so, does it also appear to protect at least those groups of people from contracting a disease? Effectiveness, on the other hand, describes how the same vaccine will perform when it's released into the wild, if you will, out there in the real world, when it's given to people on a much wider scale. Um, this aspect of vaccine performance is also monitored, of course, after approval is granted. But data takes a lot more time to gather and to study. Um, effectiveness numbers for COVID-19 vaccines will almost certainly vary from the efficacy numbers we've been hearing about lately in the news. Um, they'll be different in people in different age groups, for example. And although we're optimistic that current candidates will indeed protect a high percentage of people in the general public who receive them, um, don't forget that calculating both efficacy and, and effectiveness requires a sort of statistical sleight of hand. Um, because after all, you're trying to figure out how many people didn't get a disease because they received a vaccine. Or, or to flip that idea on its head, uh, what might have happened had they not been vaccinated. And, and that's a, a pretty slippery concept.